Welcome to episode 7 of season 7 of the Gospel to Humans podcast. Today, we're going to discuss three common myths about the King James Bible. Let's get after it. Thank you for joining me for the Gospel of the Games podcast. I'm your host, Richard Stormenorman. Here to tell you everything I know, some things I highly suspect. Today we're going to look at three common myths that people use against people who believe God has preserved His Word in the King James Bible. We're going to be using, for the most part, Brother Sam Gipps, The Answer Book reading some of this out here and of course you'll get my own personal commentary as well because that is kind of why you tuned in right so we'll be doing that i wanted to do five of them but then i thought you know we'll do three and then maybe we'll we'll do this again because i want to do it again (laughs) so we're going to do we'll do some more later maybe i don't know if it'll be this season next season but we'll do we'll do this we'll revisit this topic and do three more later on and whatnot this is a good book though now that i've read it i've been i've read you know the way it's broke down is each chapter is a question there's one some of them are long some of them are short there's another one so it's pretty good stuff in here anyway before we get into that how are you doing this Monday that I'm off work. I've been off work since Friday. I took Friday off because I had the day off. So I figured, you know, I got the day off. Let's go ahead and take Friday off and have a four day weekend. It'd be great. It'd be wonderful. And it has been. Gotten quite a bit done. Uh, weather, been wet, been pretty much raining every day, but that's okay. You know, even when it's raining, it's still a good day if you're not at work. It's always good. And also I had some time and I did a, a, a video for the YouTube channel. At Bible Buying 101. Is it what it's called? I should check. I'm not going to do it now. I'm curious how many people watched that video. It's about 45 minutes and I basically gave you all the information. All the knowledge I have about Bibles uh, that I've accumulated over the years. Uh... And we went through terminology, uh, you know, Bible terminology. I'm talking about the physical, not the, not what's inside. Because, you know, you buy a King James Bible that costs a dollar. It's got the same stuff inside of it uh, as one that costs $200. It's just the difference in, you know, how long that thing's going to last. So we went into that. It was about 45-minute video. But, and there are some things I left out when I was watching it again after I got done. I was like, ah, oh, I forgot to mention this and this, stuff like that. But for the most part, you know, you got all the knowledge I had there. I gave it to you. So hopefully that'll help you when you're, when you're going to buy a Bible. Because nobody wants to buy a Bible, you know, and have to buy a new one every other year because it keeps falling apart. You just buy a good one and it lasts you a while. So go check out that video if you need some knowledge some learning bibles i've been using this week same old uh, actually i took my preaching bible to church yesterday and taught sunday school out of it my old faithful i left it in the trunk though so i don't have it i need to go get it same bible's always been using uh that i did my bible reading out of the uh cambridge turquoise earlier because I was two days behind. There was one other Bible I was using. Oh, I was using the CBB hand size turquoise earlier as well. But same, I was looking at Bibles earlier and kind of like, you know, straightening them up and stuff. And I was like, man, I need a new Bible. Of course, I'm sure I'm not the only one that says that. <laughs> But anyway, anniversary 
of the gospel arguments is March 7th. And I know that because I was cleaning out my pictures that I have saved on my computer. And I saw the one from last year that I posted, the graphic I posted, uh, yeah, last year for the four year anniversary. So it's March 7th is the, uh, five year anniversary of gospel arguments. And we're doing a Bible giveaway. Like I said, for people who live in the United States, uh, United States shipping only and uh, it starts right now this is Church Bible Publishers large print readers edition in goat skin with a calf skin liner let me see if it's got some information on it I did an unboxing of this so you can go check out. I never did a review, but I did an unboxing of it. It's item number 155RL GOAT is what it is. Now, RL is because it's red letter. Let me show you. So, essentially, let me give you the breakdown. Essentially, what this is is the uh, Church Bible Publishers Turquoise with a larger font now i know if you've ever seen a turquoise you're like well it has a pretty good size font already well i don't know what size this font is i'll put it on the screen for you because i don't know it now but when i'm editing this video i'll go find it and i'll put it on the screen for you and compare the regular turquoise font to what size this one is uh but that's why it's called the large print reader's edition i reckon because uh it's the turquoise just with bigger font so it's the same size you know all these directions it's just a little bit thicker than the turquoise I think it's about the same thickness as the uh, note takers so it's a good heavy Bible I think I took it to church one time but it's a little bit too heavy for me personally to be taken to church uh, and it's good goat skin it's like a what do they call this an antique or something I'm not sure they had some term for it it's like a brown and black and marbled type thing they got going on here and three really long ribbons hanging off there so it's a good Bible it's a good lap Bible I had this in my lap on the couch one time doing my Bible reading from it and uh, it just sits there so good in your lap because it's heavy <laughs> I ain't gonna lie it's heavy uh it's a big one uh, it's easy to read it's the turquoise so if you've ever seen the turquoise you know how the text is self-pronouncing it's got the center column references and all that and uh no markings i have not marked in this bible so there's no markings in it maybe a few little scratches on the guilt but i love this bible I bought it because it's the only goat skin one that CBP has and I wanted to try it out and I really like it but I just don't use it that much because it's a little on the big side for someone like me I'm not a, not a big feller I'm tall but I'm not big so I like a little bit I like thinner Bibles I like smaller Bibles and this one's just a little bit too big for my liking other than that fantastic Bible though so if you want to win this, here's what you're going to need to do. Pretty simple. Comment down below that you would like to be entered into the contest on the YouTube video. If you don't watch the YouTube video, if you listen to me uh, on a podcast app or whatever, shoot me an email at gospelarguments at gmail.com. Let me know you want to be entered into the contest. And we're going to let it go for two weeks. Uh, what's, let me get my calendar here. Mm. Starting, starting, what's, when is this episode coming out? What's the day? 15th, so it'll be out 17th. I'm going to let it run until March 3rd. March 3rd, does that make sense? I guess so, we'll do that. Uh, cause the, the, uh, anniversary technically is on a sunday 
So March 3rd will be the when the episode before the yeah we'll do that. So we'll let it run until March 3rd, starting today, uh, going to March 3rd. So you got two weeks. So I'm, I'm really good at hitting that microphone. So you got two weeks to enter a Bible giveaway if you'd like to enter to win. If you live in the United States and you'd like to enter to win the large print reader's edition here in Goat Skin, let me know in the comments or shoot me an email and uh, we'll enter you into the contest. And uh, if you're an international uh, listener, sorry, but when we do the Bible giveaway at the end of the year, at the end of the season, <clears throat> you'll be more than eligible to enter that one. Thank you. Let's get into the main topic, three myths about the KJV. If you're like me and you believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God, you probably you probably hear a lot of uh, misinformed nonsense from people who disagree with you. There's plenty of information out there to dispel these myths, but you know, as we all as we all know very well, in the year 2021, people tend to flock to information that supports what they want to believe. People don't want uh, information; they want confirmation. They want to go. That's why liberals watch CNN and conservatives watch Fox or whatever, because they don't want to. They don't want information. They want someone to tell them that they're right for believing the way they do. And that's uh, why there's why there's some market for that, to be honest with you. Anyway, so I know this episode is not going to change many people's minds because if you know if you don't believe the King James is the Word of God, then I'm probably not going to change your mind about it. You have to do your own research, and even then, you probably you know, if you want to believe something, you're going to believe it regardless of how much truth gets tossed at you. But it's good information to know, nonetheless. So for this episode, like I said, I'll be using the answer book by Dr. Sam Yip, as well as supplementing some of my own commentary. Hello? Number one. You don't even use the 1611. You use the 1769. Or, you know, they'll be like, well, which, which K, what's KJV do you use? The 1611 or just blah, 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 or whatever. Or they'll be like, oh, if you had a 1611, you couldn't even read it, which is incorrect. I do have a 1611 facsimile. Not sure where it's at. Probably should have got it, but it really ain't that hard to read, to be honest with you. But anyway, the accusation is that the 1611 KJV was revised several times after it was published. Is that true? Is that true? No, sorry. That is not true, but that's what they'll say. But it's not true. Now, just to uh, give you an example, if I type an essay... Yeah, you know, type essays for school every now and then. And then I go back through that essay and fix the spelling mistakes that I made, which I really don't have to do because I have Grammarly. But uh, say I didn't have Grammarly or any kind of spell check. And I went through, typed out this essay, three, four pages, whatever. Start back at the beginning, go back through it. And say, oh, that word's spelled wrong. That word's fixed that and spelled wrong. Would that change the essay? Would it be a different essay? No, it wouldn't, right? It'd be the same essay. So, let's read a little excerpt from the book here. And Brother Gip has in here this pamphlet. So this is not his words, but it's the words of Dr. Uh, David F. Reagan. Although the printing press had been invented in 1450 by Johann Gutenberg in Germany, 161 years before the 1611 printing, the equipment used by the printer had changed very little. Printing was still very slow and difficult. All type was set by hand, one piece at a time. That's one piece at a time through the whole Bible. And errors were an expected part of any completed book. Because of this difficulty, and also because the 1611 printers had no earlier editions from which to profit, the very first edition of the King James Version had a number of printing errors. As shall later be demonstrated, these were not the sort of textual alterations which are freely made in modern Bibles. 
They were simple, obvious printing errors of the sort that can still be found at times in recent editions even with all the advantages of modern printing. These errors do not render the Bible useless, but they should be corrected in later editions. So, back in the day, and it, you know, we're not that far removed from printing being this way. Uh, all the letters had to be put on the press one at a time to spell out words. And, you know, when you're doing something as massive as the Bible... There's going to be times where people, you know, they're not paying attention or maybe they're a little bit tired. They don't put the, the, the letters on there correctly and it gets printed with misspelled words and things out of place and whatnot. So when you go back and change that, you didn't actually change the Bible. You just changed some mistakes in the spelling and the grammar and whatnot. And we'll get to that. It's more of that in a minute. So going back to my, uh, my essay example. Now, say I wrote this entire essay, and uh, I go back and I'm looking at it, I'm like, I just don't like that font. Or maybe it's one of them situations like when I went to Liberty, and everything I typed had to be in Times New Roman. But, you know, when I open up my Word program, uh, it's an Arial or whatnot, or whatever it's in. So I had to switch it over. So say I went back through the essay I wrote, just change the font. Change it from Arial to Times New Roman. Did that change the essay? No, it didn't. It's still the essay. It just looks different, but it's still the essay. For proper examination, the changes can be divided into three kinds. Printing changes, spelling changes, and textual changes. Printing changes will be considered first. The type style used in 1611 by the KJV translators was the Gothic type style. The type style you're reading now and are familiar with is Roman type. Gothic type is sometimes called Germanic because it originated in Germany. Remember that, th remember that is where printing was invented. The Gothic letters were formed to resemble the hand-drawn manuscript letters of the Middle Ages. At first, it was only it was the only style in use. The Roman type style was invented fairly early, but many years passed before it became the predominant style in most European countries. Gothic continued to be used in Germany until recent years. In 1611 in England, Roman type was already very popular and would soon supersede the Gothic. However, the original printers chose the Gothic style for the KJV because it was considered to be more beautiful and eloquent than the Roman. But the change to Roman type was not long in coming. In 1612, the first King James Version using Roman type was printed. Within a few years, all the Bibles printed used the Roman type style. So, there's editions of the KJV that came out after 1611, that they changed the spelling. Uh, they changed the font style. That does none of that changes what it actually, what the text actually says, though, does it? Long story short, corrections were made to the original 1611. The font was changed. The spelling was corrected and updated. You know, some words changed the way they were spelled. Uh, you can see that if you look at a 1611 facsimile, you'll see that. Some words just changed. The way they were spelled was just changed. So the Bible, the King James was updated accordingly. Words that were grammatically wrong were corrected. But there was no revision made. There was one as far as textual changes I want to read about. The changes from the 1611 edition that are admittedly textual are obviously printing errors because of the nature of these changes. They are not textual changes made to alter the reading. In the first printing, words were sometimes inverted. Sometimes a plural was written as singular or vice versa. At times, a word was miswritten for one that was similar. A few times, a word or even a phrase was omitted. The omissions were obvious and did not have the doctrinal implications of those found in modern translations. And if... In fact, there is really no comparison between the correction made in the King James text and those proposed by the scholars of today. 
So let's move on to number two. But the original King James had the Apocrypha in it. Oh no. Now technically, this isn't a myth. This is not a myth. Is this true? The original King James did have the Apocrypha in it. But the thing is, when people say this, they're implying, what they're implying is what's the myth. They're implying that the King James translators put the Apocrypha in because they considered them canon and part of Scripture. And that is not true. That is a myth. The Catholic Church views the Apocryphal books as canon, and they include them in their Bibles as part of the actual text. That's why, like, this Bible here does not have the Apocrypha in it. Therefore, it would not be, uh, what's the word? would not be approved for reading by Catholics, by the Vatican or whoever it is that's in charge of those things. So the, the Catholic Bibles, you'll be easy to spot them because they have the apocryphal books in the text, like woven within where they would go in the Old Testament. Uh, outside of Catholicism, these books are not accepted as canonical or inspired. But at the time of the KJV being published, they were viewed as having historical value. Thus, they were included in the KJV, but not as part of the text. But they were rather placed between testaments. And here's what Brother Gipp says. If having the Apocrypha between the testaments disqualifies it as authoritative, then the corrupt Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts from Alexandria, Egypt, must be totally worthless since their authors obviously didn't have the conviction of the King James translators and incorporated its books into the text of the Old Testament, thus giving it authority with Scripture. That's why, you know, people talk about, uh, they make, well, this is another accusation, but we're not going to talk about it today, but they'll say, oh, the King James is a Catholic Bible. That's not true at all. Uh, it don't take a lot of research to discover that, but... Bibles based on these new these manuscripts, the, uh, <clears throat> the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts, those are Catholic manuscripts. Vaticanus, Catholic Vatican. It was found in in the basement at the ba at the Vatican. That's pretty Catholic. I don't know why you tell me my Bible's Catholic when yours is clearly Catholic. Anyway. Number three, King James was a homosexual. Now, this is technically uh, about the Bible itself, but about the man who authorized the printing of it. And people like to use this one. I know that's right. Now, when you stand for the Word of God, you're bound to have enemies, correct? You are bound to have enemies. Such is the case here. Such is the case with old King James. One of King James' enemies was a man he had kicked out of his court named Anthony Weldon. And obviously, uh, this, this didn't make Weldon too happy, so he vowed to get revenge. He waited until 25 years after James died to write a paper accusing the late king of being a homosexual. How very convenient to wait until a man has died to make an accusation when he can't defend himself. The paper was largely ignored at the time because most people who knew the king knew it was false. But these names, it, it seems to be a last-ditch effort by correct Bible lovers to discredit the KJV. Let me read you what Brother Gip says. We'll start. Uh, we'll read some of this here. King James I of England, who authorized the translation of the now famous King James Bible, was considered by many to be one of the greatest if not the greatest monarchs that England has ever seen. Through his wisdom and determination, he united the warring tribes of Scotland into a unified nation and then joined England and Scotland to form the foundation for what is now known as the British Empire. At a time when only the churches of England possessed the Bible in English, King James' desire was that the common people should have the Bible in their native tongue. Thus, in 1603, King James called 54 of history's most learned men together to accomplish this great task. At a time when the leaders of the world wished to keep their subjects in spiritual ignorance, King James offered his subjects the greatest gift that he could give them, their own copy of the Word of God in English. James, who was fluent 
in Latin, Greek, and French, and schooled in Italian and Spanish, even wrote a tract entitled Counterblast to Tobacco, which he was written to help thwart the use of tobacco in England. Such a man was sure to have enemies. One such man, Anthony Weldon, had to be excluded from the court. Weldon swore vengeance. It was not until 1650, 25 years after the death of King James, that Weldon saw his chance. He wrote a paper calling James a homosexual. Obviously, James, being dead, was in no condition to defend himself. The report was largely ignored since there were still enough people alive who knew it wasn't true. In fact, it lay dormant for years until recently when it was picked up by Christians who hoped that vilifying King James would tarnish the Bible that bears his name so that Christians would turn away from God's book to a more modern translation. It seems, though, that Weldon's false account is being once again largely ignored by the majority of Christianity, with the exception of those with an ulterior motive, such as its author had. So, those are some myths. People, honestly, most people, you know, scholars, they can't stand the fact that you can hold up this Bible right here and say, I have the Word of God right here in my hand. They don't believe that there is a perfect Word. Like a quote I posted on my Facebook the other day. In fact, let me go get it. Here it is. from. Uh, this is also from Dr. Sam Gipp. If tomorrow all the King James Bible advocates stood up and said we are changing our ways, we no longer believe the King James Bible is perfect, in fact, we agree 100% with our former opponents that the King James Bible is riddled with errors. There would be a massive amen from all those who oppose us today. They would say things like, it's about time you came to your senses, or it's good to see you left the Ruckman cult, or other encouraging words. But if right after we made that statement, we said the reason we no longer believe the King James Bible is the perfect word of God is because we now believe the new international version is the perfect word of God. As soon as our anti King James opponents heard that, they would rend their clothes, cast us in the air, and cry, they're still crazy. Why would this happen? Because their opposition isn't to the concept that the King James Bible is the perfect word of God. Their opposition is actually to the concept that there is a perfect Bible anywhere on earth. So that's generally what people have a problem with. How can you say the King James Bible is the Word of God and the other ones aren't? Well, you can't even claim that those are. Your problem is that we claim we have a Bible and you claim well, only the originals. We don't have them. We don't have them. Fat, let's read Psalm chapter 12. I should get my notes out where I taught this at church. And do a podcast episode on it. Psalm chapter 12. Y'all probably know it. Some of y'all Bible students know it. I'm going to read the whole thing. Help Lord, for the God, help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful man from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a doable and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all the flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own who is Lord over us. For the oppression of the poor, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver trod in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. So God has promised to preserve his word. It says it right there. And I, you know, there's arguments people make, and that's why I did that uh, message at church about Psalm chapter 12. Uh, because someone said, well, you can't use chapter 12, you can't use Psalms 12 to say that God preserved his word. And I'm like, why not? They're like, well, just read the text. So I did, and I'm like, 
I don't see, I really don't see <laughs> what you're talking about. The text makes it pretty clear that we're just talking about poor people. He starts off talking about poor people. I don't want to get into this because this thing's already getting long. But he starts off talking about poor people. But then when you get to verse uh, 5, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise. Now what does it say there? Saith the Lord. I will set him in the safety for him that puffeth at him. So the Lord is speaking there, okay? Word of the Lord. The words of the Lord are pure words. That's silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now they're not talking about poor people no more. Now they're talking about the words of the Lord. And that he will preserve them from this generation forever. So... And there's other, you know, so many verses in here. You know, the one about the flower fades away, but my words will never fade away. God's preserved his word. And you know, some people might want to sit there and say, oh, only the originals were inspired. We don't have the originals no more. But what we do have, what God did give us, is his word in our language. Well, you got to go to the Greek to understand. No, I don't. I have it in English right here. I don't speak Greek. You don't either. So, anyway, that's three myths about the KJV. We're a little long today, so I better wrap this up. Uh, for all the information you need regarding the podcast, including social media, how to support financially, how to be saved, information on me, your host, you know, not one, not saying go check me out, I'm famous or anything. I'm just saying if you want to know more about me, my testimony a little bit, and uh, why I do this, there's a little section on the on the website for that. Costalarygimmits.org is where you can go figure that out. I'm pretty proud of that rep website, to be honest with you. I worked a lot on it, and I like the way it looks. If you want to buy a t-shirt, Costalarygimmits t-shirt, you can do so here at this link. And it will also be in the description below. Think about designing a new, a new designed t-shirt put on there. Uh, thinking about it. Of course, all that will happen after May when I get out of school and I have some time. Uh, but maybe we'll see. And, and, of course, I do want to get the hats. I, w I want to get some hats made, too. If you like what you saw today, subscribe, like, share, rate, review, follow, so on and so forth. And before I let you go, let me ask you, are you saved? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? If you realize there has never been a time in your life when you put your faith in Christ as your personal Savior... I'm going to read to these verses, okay? Romans 10, 9 and 10. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Amen. So if you ain't saved, you need to get saved. Because I can tell you right now, looking at the way things are, we ain't too far away from Jesus coming and snatching his church on up out of here. And you don't want to be one that's still standing here like, what happened? If you don't, I'm telling you. So, thank y'all for joining me for episode 7 of season number 7. I hope I said that right at the beginning. Anyway, till next week, tape across, carry on. <laughs>
I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light.